I want to start us here. Before we turn to Acts 15, I want to start here. Dumb question. Have any of you ever witnessed or been a part of a church split? Anybody? Quick show of hands. Has any ever, anybody ever been caught up or know somebody who has been caught up in a church controversy? Anybody? Show of hands. It's not fun. No matter if you're non-denominational, no matter what denomination you are, it's not fun. Oh, it weighs on your soul. It drains you. It drains you. You know, I remember one time uh, my professor of church history at the first seminary I went to walked us through church history, walked us through how each denomination got off the ground, and he started talking in a loving, kind way about the strengths and weaknesses of each of the denominations we were studying. As a Baptist, he made fun of Calvinists, but then I was so impressed with my professor. Love this man to this day, still call him from time to time. He said, and just for the record, I'm a Baptist, and we're famous for church splits, right? He said, there's more denominations within the Baptist faith than I can even count. Can I tell you a story about a Baptist split? My grandmother and grandfather on my mother's side in rural Georgia were progressive, primitive Baptists. How do progressive and primitive go together? <laughs> you know what the difference between a progressive, primitive Baptist and a primitive Baptist was? Here's what led to the split, any guesses? Money, a popular pastor, certain position, we didn't dunk them hard enough. No, the progressive primitive Baptists are different from the primitive Baptists in this. The progressive primitive Baptists can have air conditioning. That's what led to the split. I loved going to church with my grandma and grandpa. Why? Because in rural Georgia, it is hot, it is humid, there's a lot of gnats, and you need air conditioning, right? But it's sad that something like that causes a split. Well, as we come to Acts 15 this morning, we see that there is a bigger issue, a more serious issue than air conditioning that is threatening to split the church. There's a gospel issue. This gospel issue is threatening the unity, the peace, the fellowship of the church. It's threatening the mission of the church. And as we see how the church sent their apostles and elders to come together in a council to bring this issue to order, to resolve it in a godly way, we see help, we see hope, we see guidelines for what we can do today to address issues as they come up, but we also see some wonderful hints, some wonderful hints for how to avoid them in the first place. Does that sound good? Oh man, we're gonna go through the text. We're gonna be in Acts chapter 15. We're gonna go through 34 verses this morning, one through 34. No, it's not gonna be an hour long sermon. I promise you that, okay? But here's what we will do this morning. We're gonna chunk it up. I know you're used to me reading all at once. I'm gonna read a section at a time, stop and explain. And as I explain and navigate us through these 34 verses, we will then at the very end hold the application. So for those of you who are used to Pastor John, Pastor Brad gives you a chunk, there's application, we're just walking through the text. We're taking a stroll through the text, and then we will land on the application. Here's how we're going to do this this morning. There's four movements, four movements. First, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to look at the council's dilemma, the council's dilemma. After we do that in the first couple verses, we will look at the council's discussion. Council's discussion. After we cover those 12, 13 verses, we will then look at the council's decision and really hone in on verses 19 through 21, and then we'll stop and say, okay, how do we live this out today? How does this apply to us today? So the council's dilemma, the council's discussion, the council's decision, then the application. Let's look at the council's dilemma. Go with me to verses 1 through 5, Acts 15, picking it up in verse 1. Let me read it to us. This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all 
that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Oh, friends, do you see the problem? We see the problem. Look at verse 1, look at verse 5. We've got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. There are Pharisees who have become Jew, or excuse me, who have become Christians, Pharisees who have become Christians, and they are saying to these Gentile converts that have just become Christians, not raised in the church, you have to be circumcised. You have to be circumcised or you are in your sin. You have to be circumcised or you are not God's son. You are still in your guilt. You're still in your shame. All that talk of love, all that talk of mercy, grace, forgiveness. No, not unless you are circumcised. Friends, we've talked about legalism a couple times, but this is legalism, one form of legalism rearing its ugly head. They are saying Jesus plus circumcision equals your salvation, and that is a problem. That has to be opposed. But that's not the only part of the problem. Look at verse 5. When they get to Jerusalem, what do their friends say? When you are circumcised, you have to keep all of the Mosaic law, all 613 of those commands and those laws. You have to do all of that, and that creates a problem. The first thing we saw, Jesus plus circumcision equals salvation, means there's a threat to the gospel. But in this forcing Gentiles to keep the Mosaic law, to keep the dietary restrictions, to keep the festival scheme, to keep the ceremonial laws for clean and unclean creates a threat to Christian unity. It creates a threat to Christian mission. Let me show you how. Let me show you how. Imagine a Gentile family of five. Mom, dad, oldest son, Bobby, pride of the family, and his two little twin sisters, right? We've got a Gentile family, don't know Jesus. Bobby is the pride of the family. He's learning the family trade. He's worshiping the family gods. One day he goes with his buddy, little Timmy, to whatever Gentile, Youth for Christ, Young Life, Cadets, Awanis, whatever. He says, whoa, Jesus is amazing. Holy Spirit comes upon him, changes his heart. He's like, I gotta live for Jesus. I'm a Christian, right? Little Bobby has just become a Gentile Christian. He goes home, are mom and dad happy? No, he's turned his back on the family gods, on society, they're worried. Now let's impose circumcision and the Mosaic law on Bobby. Little Timmy comes up to Bobby and says, hey man, you only sealed half the deal. We gotta do one other thing and it's gonna hurt, right? You gotta go get circumcised. A, not cool, cruel. B, let's watch how this plays out. Bobby goes off to work, goes off, sneaks away, gets circumcised, comes home, Guess what? It smells great in the house. Why? Because mom has been slaving over a pork shoulder the whole day. Oh, pulled pork, it's the best, isn't it? But because Bobby is now circumcised, he's looking at that pork shoulder and just like, oh man, mom, I can't eat it. Why not? Well, I'm now a Christian. I have to follow all these laws. Pork is out. This isn't good, right? Dad is sitting there going, And my dad thought he had it rough when I just got a tattoo, right? Mom is off crying in the corner. Poor Bobby just wants a pulled pork sandwich and a bag of ice, and his twin sisters are eating his share of the pork, right? Not cool. Is this family who already has enough barriers to coming to faith in Jesus, are they more likely to come in Jesus as a result of this circumcision and this following of the law? Are they more likely or less likely? Who votes more likely, right? Who votes less likely? Do you see the threat? And moreover, it's not just the threat to the family because Bobby now, just by associating with Gentiles, he's unclean. He can't go to Sunday worship. He can't go to the synagogue on Saturday night, Friday night. He can't enter in. Bobby has to pick between his biological family and his spiritual family. Do you see that? This is a threat to fellowship. Bobby's discipleship and Christian mission. Are you starting to see the problem here? Are you seeing the dilemma before the council? It's not the only problem. Look at verses three and four. Look at verses three and four. Do you see how imposing circumcision, this form of legalism, robs joy? Do you see how it robs joy? Look at verse three. 
Paul and Barnabas are sent to Jerusalem to help bring this thing to order, to help land the plane, and they go through Phoenicia, they go through Samaria. Those are Jewish Christians, and they're happy. They're joyful. They have been persecuted. They have been disowned. We saw them in Acts 8 get persecuted, right? And here's the thing. They know joy. They know comfort. They're hearing that Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is on the move saving the Gentiles. It warms their heart. It comforts them. It's like a nice warm blanket on a cold night. And they're saying, yes, this sacrifice has been worthwhile. And then look at verse 4 when they go to Jerusalem. They're welcomed. This is a happy scene. They get to declare all that God has done. This is a happy scene. These Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, they're amped, they're pumped. This is warm. There is joy. There is goodness. But can the Pharisee Christians celebrate? Do they know joy? Do they know the joy of verses 3 and 4? No. They are so focused on what man does. They are so focused on a man-made action, a work. They can't rejoice in what our God is doing. Are you starting to see this problem as we flesh this out? We've got to do something about this. We've got to bring this thing to order. There's the dilemma. What's the solution? We find the solution beginning in the council's discussion. Let's go ahead and let's move into our second point. Let's look at the council's discussion. What do they do? Let me read to you verse 6, part of verse 7. Verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. They send people, they send their elders, they send their apostles, the ones who are the spiritual leaders, have the spiritual authority. They get together in a council, much like once a quarter, Pastor Brad, myself, sometimes our ruling elders, we gather together in a group of regional churches called a presbytery. And then once a year, this June, Pastor Brad and I will go to Birmingham where all the elders in the PCA get together. We call this General Assembly. That's, this is the passage we get this from. They send their best. They send their spiritual, spiritually gifted leaders together to resolve the issue. What happens in verse 7? And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said, stop right there. Are you proud of Peter? Are you proud? After there was much debate. <laughs> Peter is known for being brash. He's known for not being scared to like mix it up, get in a brouhaha, right? Peter is impulsive. He's the guy who wants to get after the people that would attack Jesus. He's the guy who says, Jesus, I'll never leave you. And Jesus is like, oh, about that, we need to talk, right? But look at Peter. Did he mix it up in the debate? Peter has grown. He's been sanctified. He's been made more like Jesus. Peter's a more patient man. Do you see that? Come on, if there's hope for Peter, there's hope for you. There's hope for me. There's hope for your pastors, your elders, your deacons, your community group leaders. There's hope for all of us. God is good and he changes us. Look at Peter. But what does Peter say? How does Peter help resolve this issue? Let me read verses 7 through 11. Look at this with me. Peter says, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. As we look at the council's discussion, we see one of the big guns of the Christian faith get up and basically shoot glaring holes through the Pharisees' argument. If the Pharisees were focused on man's activity, Peter says, we've got to get the attention off of man. The spotlight belongs on God. Did you see Peter do that in these verses? Let's go back through the verses one by one and look how Peter stresses God as the subject doing the verb. There's only one verse where man does something and it doesn't go well. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Do you see how Peter says, God is the one who chose me to go preach? Do you see how in verse 8, Peter says, it's God who knew their heart. It's God who bore witness to them. God who claimed them and said, these are mine. Why? Because God gave them the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 9, God has destroyed the distinction between us and them. How? 
He is the one who cleansed their hearts. Do you see Peter's emphasis on God's activity? And then in verse 10, he says, when we get involved, it doesn't go well, right? We couldn't uphold the yoke, the law. Our forefathers, our ancestors sure couldn't uphold the yoke, the law. And we're going to expect different out of the Gentiles? No, when we get involved, it goes bad. But look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. How will we all be saved, Jew and Gentile, by God saving us through the grace of who? Not man, but the God-man, Jesus. Do you see how Peter keeps time and time again saying, get the spotlight off of man. Get the spotlight off of yourself. Look at what God is doing. Look at what he is doing. Peter is saying, guys, we got to get the gospel right here. We've got to make sure we're clear on this. It's threatening unity. It's threatening mission because we have this, this misalignment with what the gospel really is. Come back to the Lord. Come back to the statement, Yeshua, God saves not you and me. You see what Peter's doing there? Makes sense? Because that's not all. Peter gets up. And as we look at verse 12, we're actually going to see the next two big guns, Paul and Barnabas, basically say the same thing. Let's read verse 12. Let's read verse 12. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Luke does not give us a direct quote of Paul and Barnabas. We know Paul to be a very wordy man. Anyone ever read the book of Romans? Anybody ever gotten it on the first time through? Paul is a top-notch scholar, first-rate theologian. He would have had a PhD in his day. What we know that Paul and Barnabas said, what they emphasized is God used us. God used us to do signs and wonders. And what have we said about signs and wonders throughout the book of Acts? They confirm that God is speaking through these men by those signs and wonders. Every person at this council would have been at or known about Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit came down in tongues of fire, people spoke in tongues. Everybody in this room had probably met the man in Acts 3 who was healed, the lame man. They've probably witnessed or maybe even been the recipient of a miracle, and they're going, wait a minute. The exact same signs and wonders that happened to us are happening to the Gentiles. What's the conclusion? God is on the move. He is doing this. Peter shoots a hole in the argument. Paul and Barnabas widen the hole. Now, those are three pretty big guns, right? Three pretty big, big guns. Peter, Paul, probably the two most famous Christians ever after Jesus. You bring in Barnabas, but actually the biggest gun has not yet spoken. His name is James. Let's talk about James. How many of you have heard of James? James right? Author of the book of James, which is called by many the most moral book in the New Testament. James is a Jew of Jews. The book of James is called the most Jewish book in the New Testament. The reformer Martin Luther actually did not like the book of James because he thought it had too much law and not enough grace. Now, here's the thing. Is James, who is a Jew, who is Jesus' brother, is James, who is a Jew, who is nicknamed James the Just because he followed the law and pursued righteousness so closely, do you think this man is on Team Pharisee or Team Grace? You'd think he's on Team Pharisee. As he gets up to speak to Pharisees, you kind of hear them going, James, James, James. And some immature guy's like, get him, James. Why? Because James is a Jew of Jews. James is functionally a Pharisee. But look at what James says. Will you read verse 13 through 18 with me? Let's look at this. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon, being Peter, Simon's, or Simon is the Jewish name for Peter. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as, as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. What just happened? James just put two final nails in the coffin. What are those two nails? 
What's going to put this circumcision argument to rest? The first nail was in verse 14. Look at verse 14. Do you see how James also emphasizes God's activity? He is the subject doing the verb. God visited the Gentiles. He double clicks on what Peter, Paul, and Barnabas have said. This is from the Lord. And then he puts the second biggest nail in the coffin by quoting Scripture. The most important man in this assembly, James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, brings the most important authority to bear. How does he do it? By quoting God's word. What did he quote? He quoted the book of Amos. James is saying, hey guys, as I read this text, I'm seeing that when the Messiah comes to rebuild the tent of David, which is Israel, when the Messiah comes to rebuild Israel, what's going to happen? Everyone, including the Gentiles, will seek my name. James is saying, this prophecy is being lived out before us. Their experience, we find it in the scriptures. When I check out our highest authority, the Bible, their experience checks out. Game, set, match, grace wins. Do you see it? At this point, it's a mute point. Here's the thing. These apostles, these elders, these apostles and elders have protected the gospel they protected church unity. They protected the ongoing mission of the church. There's just a few loose ends to tie up. We need to, we need to tie them up. We need to look at them as we see the council's decision. The council's decision. How are we going to tie up these loose ends? Look at verses 19 through 21. We're really going to hone in here. James says, therefore, he continues, therefore, my judgment is is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. I don't know if you caught it, but what James just did is brilliant. This is the plan that will be adopted in verses 22 through 34. Please go home this afternoon, maybe do a family Bible study on those passages. But this plan will be adopted, it will be approved, it will be sent out, and it's brilliant. James creates a win-win. He creates a win for the Gentiles, but rather than marginalizing the Pharisees, kicking them out, saying, via con Dios, good riddance, we'll see you later, he makes sure they're brought in. He extends grace to them. Watch how there's a win-win. Go with me to verse 19. Go with me to verse 19. Do you see where James says, we should not trouble those of the Gentiles? James has a pastoral heart for people who are different than him. That word trouble can be translated, don't crowd them in. Don't hem them up and bind them with these 613 requirements of the law. That is a burden that Jesus removed. Get it off of them. Do you see his heart? Do you see him protecting their freedom? This is a win for the Gentiles. Moreover, this is a win for church unity. This is a win for the ongoing mission to the Gentiles. But that's not all he does. He doesn't just remove barriers on the Gentile side. He removes barriers on the Jewish side. Look at verse 21. Look with me at verse 21. This is kind of a confusing verse if we're honest. What does it mean? What is James saying? For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him. What James is saying is this. Hey, Gentiles, Gentile Christians, hey, Paul and Barney, look at me. He says, all throughout the Mediterranean basin, in every major city, there is a synagogue. You have brother Jewish Christians sister Jewish Christians that go to the synagogue to hear Moses read, and that is a good thing. We keep the Old Testament. So here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. Some of them are new Christians also. Some of them have been ostracized. Some of them have been raised. We don't eat pork. Look at verse 20. He says, we don't eat food that has been sacrificed to idols. We don't go to the temples where there's lots of prostitution. We don't eat meat that has been strangled, and we drain the blood out of it because that is what the law taught us. Hey, rather than 613 requirements, how about you do this? 
follow these four biggies. And that way, when you invite that brand new Jewish Christian into your home, they won't be squeamish when mama puts the pulled pork down. They won't be squeamish because you've offered them a meal they can eat. You're not gonna cause them to violate their conscience. Protect their conscience the way we just protected your freedom. And oh, by the way, if you follow these guidelines that I'm laying down, they might bring a non-Christian Jew who does not yet know Jesus as Messiah, and maybe you can talk to him about it. Share your faith with them, and now the mission to the Jews can keep going forward as well. Do you see the brilliance here? Do you see how on both sides, James has cleared a way to protect the gospel, extend grace, keep joy, protect the unity and the fellowship of the church, and to protect the church's mission? Isn't that pretty cool? And then look at the results in 22 through 34. We're not going to read it. We're not going to camp there. But look at verse 22. There is a happy ending here, folks. So many churches, when they know strife, they just split today. They give up. It's like no-fault divorce, and it's sad. Jesus' bride is ripped apart. This has a happy ending. This is a good ending. They send two men, Jude and Silas. Anybody know what kind of name Jude is? Judas, excuse me. It's a Jewish name. It's a Jewish name. Anybody know who Silas was? We find him in Acts 16. He is a Roman citizen. At best, he's a Hellenistic Jew. At worst, he's a Gentile. They send somebody who can represent the Gentile Christian side, somebody who can represent the Jewish Christian side, and what do they do? They go and they read the letter and look at verse 31. What's the response? Joy, rejoicing, joy in Christ, joy in the Lord is restored, is not threatened. And then in verse 32, this Jewish Christian and this potential Gentile Christian minister together side by side in an amazing symbolic sign of unity to keep the mission going forward, to keep the unity, to keep the integrity and the purity of the gospel as they encourage, strengthen, and build up the church. Isn't that amazing? Well, James was on to something, right? Pretty wise guy, pretty wise guy. Now let's ask, let's close here. What do we learn from this? How can we apply this today? We have four application points for you. I want to start by looking at James's advice and seeing how we could apply that today. There's four things. Two from James's advice, two from just the whole passage as I've taken as a whole. First is this. Living out James's advice today looks like this. We have to put other people ahead of ourselves. It's commanded in Scripture. It's what Jesus did for you. He put you ahead of him when he went to the cross. He put you ahead of him when he came to this earth. Friends, this is life in Christ. This is life in Christ. So how do we do this? How do we do this? In my neighborhood, I have Muslim neighbors. I have Muslim neighbors. Here's what James would say to me. He would say, hey, John, I know you love smoking meats. I know that's like your heart's desire after preaching, right? Is to go grill up, to go smoke some awesome baby backs. One day we're gonna get a Boston butt, do some pulled pork. But John, if one of those Muslims had come to faith in Jesus and you had them over, can you put that aside for the time being? Once they convert, they're not just gonna stop on a dime and give up their Muslim-like inhibitions about pork. It's gonna be weird for them. I know you're free to eat dead pig slathered in barbecue sauce, but for the sake of Jesus and this person's soul, can you set it aside? Take them shooting guns instead. Talk to them about muscle cars instead. Disciple them, right? And by setting these things aside, you have more opportunities for fellowship, more opportunities for discipleship. There's Christian unity, right? But you also have more opportunities for mission because as this person becomes comfortable and safe around you and you are value added in their life, they will come to you with what to do about their Muslim family. And you might get to do some evangelism with some other people. Do you see that's how what James would say to me? What would James say? Maybe that's guys. Let's use an example for the ladies. What would James say to ladies? Let's say you had to go on a business trip, or let's say you're going to visit a foreign missionary, or you or your husband gets a job in a Muslim country. 
James would say this. He would say, I know it's considered chauvinistic, traditional, and old-fashioned in our society to wear a headscarf. I know you have freedom in Christ that says you do not have to wear that, but as you walk the streets, especially with a Muslim convert, a lady who desperately wants to know about Jesus, who cannot get access to a Bible, and you are the only Bible that she will read, in order to spend time with her and not ostracize her, not cast aspersions on her, not get her in trouble with her family, would you just go ahead and put on a headscarf? You'll be able to disciple with her. You'll be able to walk with her in public. You might meet her friends and get to share the gospel with her. Can you love Jesus more than your freedom? When you do, you can put other people first. Does that sound good? Let's bring this home. Let's bring this home. Let's, let's bring it to grace. Let's look at our second point. An extension of putting other people first is this. We have to be super careful. This is application point number two. We have to be super careful. We have to be super careful. How am I going to say this? To avoid creating unintentional Christian scorecards. What do I mean by Christian scorecards? We have our list of biblical things or traditional things or things we do in our culture and customs, and other people have to live up to those things. When somebody converts and becomes a Christian, their heart changes instantaneously, but all that baggage from their former life does not. How do we avoid putting those people on a Christian scorecard where they have to worry more about a checklist of do's and don'ts to be accepted than finding their acceptance in Jesus Christ? How do we avoid that? We be patient with them on things like creation versus evolution. We be patient with them on their sense of morality, their political views. We be patient with them on the way that they dress. We be patient with them, especially in this area, if they're from another race or another socioeconomic status. There has been so much racial strife coming out of U.S. Steel and Gary between the white, the Greek, Croatian, Serbian, and African-American communities. And let's be honest, there's strife coming over from Illinois. We have to be super care- Did I say go woke? Did I say go woke? No. No, I did not. Do not hear what I am not saying. We have to be super careful and go the extra mile when we encounter people from a different culture who have been raised in a different way. We have to be so careful with that. Let's be aware, let's be careful of people's past sins and make sure that if God doesn't hold that against them anymore, we shouldn't either. Do you see how we can unintentionally create Christian scorecards? And those Christian scorecards can raise distinctions unintentionally, well-intended, but they raise distinctions, they raise divisions that Jesus lived and died to destroy. We have to put others first. We have to be careful of creating Christian scorecards. What's number three? What's number three? Number three is this. As we step back and look at this entire passage, we see that the key themes are this. The elders met, the apostles and the elders met to protect the gospel, Christian unity, Christian mission, and Christian joy. How do we do that today? I've said this once, and I will keep saying it as long as I'm here. We settle our differences with an open Bible. We settle our differences with an open Bible. Now, I think everybody loves that, but let me break this down and make sure we're very clear here. We are a mix of people coming from different traditions. As I get to know you, as I get to know people at other churches, as I go to Presbytery and meet people from other congregations, as I go grocery shopping and meet people and talk to people, it is clear as a bell to me that we have to be so careful to not assume our traditions are in the Bible. So many people have heard things for so long from mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, two pastors ago, that resonated with them, but they don't know the verses that back it up. Do we know the traditions, but not the scriptures? Do we know the customs, but not the scriptures? Friends, we sit down with an open Bible. We have to be soft-hearted when somebody disagrees with us and they've got verses and we don't. We settle our differences with the Bible It is so easy to take our traditions, to take our customs, which are good. I'm not attacking them. 
But where it goes wrong is when we unintentionally, over time, elevate them to the status of a non-negotiable and we put them on par with God's word. And when that happens right there, we've just created a Christian scorecard. Do you see how that works? We accidentally become modern day Pharisees. We've got to be careful with that and how do we avoid that? We know the Bible, we read the Bible, we know the Bible better than any confession, any catechism. In fact, we make sure we understand as we read those other precious good documents, we're reading the verses and where they come from, we're learning the biblical why behind the what. We do that, we will avoid becoming modern day accidental Pharisees. We will avoid the Christian scorecard. That's number three. We put others first. We avoid Christian scorecards. We settle differences with open hearts and open Bible. The fourth thing we do is this. The fourth thing we do is this. We only nominate and elect godly officers. Elders and deacons, oh man, it's a high office. It is a high office. As you read this passage, you should be proud of the apostles You should be proud of the elders. And if there had been deacons present, you would be proud of them. Let's look at these guys one more time. Let's look at the big guns. Peter was culturally Jewish. Paul, culturally Jewish. Barnabas, pretty sure he was culturally Jewish. James, obviously, culturally Jewish. They gave away their traditions, their customs, They gave away their cultural, their national identity for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus' gospel, for the sake of Jesus' people, for the sake of the unity and the joy of Jesus' people and the sake of Jesus' mission. That is hard to do. They gave away their liberties. They gave away their customs. They gave away their cultures, and that is a hard word here in Libertarian, Indiana. We can never insist on our personal liberties if it comes or gets in the way of Jesus, his gospel, his people, our unity, our joy, or our mission. You should be so proud of these elders. Are there men here like that? Are there? In 12 months, Grace Church, the elders got together, we voted, we've got approval from our presbytery, from our mother church. Within 12 months, we're beginning officer training. I am so excited for this. Are there men among us? We need you thinking about this. We need you praying for it. I would dare say fast over this. We need godly men who are soft-hearted towards Christ, his gospel, his church, his mission, our joy. We need men who are hard-hearted towards threats to the gospel, threats to our fellowship, threats to our unity, threats to our joy, threats to his mission. Are there men like that among us? Oh, I'm convinced that there are. I'm convinced that there are. If you're not, What are you doing to become that kind of a man? What are you doing? Are you in the word? Are you praying? Are you asking God to show him if that's your call? Are you the kind of man who's coming in, not insisting on his agenda, like in a bombastic, domineering, I know how to fix this place. I am the Holy Spirit's gift to this church. I have spiritual authority. Are you the man who comes in and says, these are my brothers, together, We're going to pray and work with the congregation to seek God's will for grace. Oh, I'm convinced those men are out there among us. We need to know who you are. We need ladies for you to help us identify who they are. We get these things right. When we get these things right, putting other people first, avoiding scorecards, settling our differences with an open Bible, nominating and electing godly elders, grace, we can weather whatever comes our way by the Holy Spirit's power and the help of the word of God. Sound good? Let's pray. Oh, Father God, how we need you. Father God, we love you, we praise you. Father God, we ask that you would raise up godly officers for this church. Father, we ask that we would be a people of the book. Father, we ask that we would be able to see our own cultural customs and traditions and to hold them with an open hand as the light of scripture shines upon them. Father, we ask We ask by your Spirit's help, by our love for Christ, to love others greater than ourselves. And finally, Father, we ask, just help us to be aware of the ways we might cause stumbling blocks 
in the form of Christian scorecards. We love you, Father. We praise you. We thank you for your word. And all God's people say, amen. Amen.